Well, welcome to day number 327. Our guest today is Kyle Buckland. Hey, Kyle, how are you, man? Hey, Eric. Great. Honored to be here. It's an honor to have you here, man. So here's what I want to tell everybody is that Kyle's really a big painter, really big. And what I mean by that is he paints really big. Now, I'm trying to find that picture. Oh, here it is. Look at that. Take a look at that picture. I mean, he paints really big plein air pieces on location, which I think is fabulous. So we're going to learn all about Kyle today. I'll just show you some of his work. I think it's really fantastic work. And uh, just want to show you a couple more pieces. And here we go. And again, Kyle did these in plein air, on plein air, on location. Kyle, where do you live? I live in southwestern Virginia, so down in the tip of Virginia, almost into Tennessee, in the, right. the Blue Ridge Mountains. And what are you going to do for us today? Well, I'm going to do a demo from start to finish. I'm working on an 18 by 24 canvas, and I'm going to focus on uh, spontaneity and really getting a lot done in a short amount of time, because I think that's something that is sort of a a mystifying process to some people, especially when they're first starting, but it's so essential. And it's especially if you're wanting to go outside and paint, uh, you know, time is of the essence sometimes. So I'm going to, I'm going to focus on how to, to really imbue your work with a sense of energy and vitality by uh, working quickly and, and uh, directly. All right, great. And what, when you do those great big paintings on location, uh, what kind of time does something like that typically take you? Is that multiple sessions? I try to get them done in one session. I like the feeling of uh, something that's done a la prima. So um, generally two to three hours and then the light changes. I work like a, like a madman that's been uh, <laughs> possessed when I'm out there. And uh, that's, you know, it, it, it creates a certain energy in the piece that I find that I have a hard time uh, preserving if I work over multiple sessions. Yeah, great. I love it. All right, well, let's get started. We're going to get right to it here. Okay, right. go ahead and you can reset your camera or whatever you need me, to do. All right, let me first give a shout out to my cousin Daniel who got me this awesome Bob Ross uh, apron to, uh, for Christmas. So I'm wearing my let's get crazy Bob Ross apron. <laughs> all right, outstanding. Well, we have all Bob right, Ross me, kicking around here too. <laughs> here we go. Let me get the, I'll get the camera moved in so you get a good view of my palette and my uh, canvas and everything here. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Gotta, gotta love Bob. So. Well, I'll just say hi to everybody today and, uh, say we are at day 327 day 350 is coming up and day 365 is coming up. We've been here since coronavirus quarantine began. And, uh, our guest today is Kyle Buckland and we're going to see him paint an 18 by 24, which is really small for Kyle. Uh, he's, <laughs> he's normally painting really, really big paintings on location in plein air. And so, uh, Kyle, we'll have to have you out to the plein air convention so we can see you do this. And, oh, I'd love it. I'd, I'd, I'd be honored. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll have, well, hopefully we'll get to have the plein air convention someday again. We just, we yeah. just canceled it. Uh, postponed it to next year, and we're going to move it to Santa Fe for next year. So in the meantime, we're going to be doing Plein Air Live, which is our uh, our live virtual conference. Uh, we have oh, probably about 40 countries attending. We're already at over 600 people signed up. And, and the deadline for that, by the way, uh, to get your lowest price is the 28th of this month. So you got about two weeks left. Kyle, let's get started. Awesome. Well, let me say first, thank you for doing this. And thank you to all your viewers. Uh, I know we couldn't do this without everybody watching and tuning in. And I think this is just a wonderful thing that you're doing uh, for everybody to keep them inspired and keep them motivated. And uh, you are an inspiration to a lot of people. And I really appreciate that because I think as Pas Picasso said, you know, inspiration exists, but you, but it has to find you working. And I know you, uh, you, you keep the, the um, you keep the wheels turning. So that's good. Well, that's very sweet of you. Thank you. All right, um, let's do this. All right, let's get, let's just jump right in. Well, what can you I want bring to do your is, uh, camera slightly up so we can see the top of your canvas, just okay. barely a little bit more. There we go. Good. Right in there somewhere. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Awesome. Yep. And um, 
what I'm going to be doing today, I've got a little study here that's a five by seven, and this is sort of the last light on the mountaintop up here uh, late evening. So this is the kind of scene where you have to work really quickly. Um, so I'm going to be talking about how to translate that energy that you can get in a small study like this into a larger canvas. Um, and one of the things that I find that makes uh, that easy is that you do a lot of the work beforehand. So I've thought a lot about what I want to do and how I want to do this. So I've got my story I want to tell. The story is really about this strip of sunlight on this mountain. So we're not uh, mixing messages here. We, we, you know, this is the, the main character in, in the story here. And everything that we're going to be doing is going to be leading our eye into this section of the painting and telling that story. Um, another thing you can see, I've got plenty of paint laid out. So uh, I'll talk just real quickly about my colors. I've got a mixture of Gamblin and Rembrandt colors. This is cadmium red light, cadmium yellow light, ultramarine blue, uh, yellow ochre, and then I've got some ivory black just a little off camera there, uh, and titanium white. Now when I'm painting large like this, you want to have more paint than you think you need. And the reason is because you don't want to stop and interrupt the flow. So once you get started, you want everything to be working correctly, and you don't want to have to stop to squeeze out more paint. So I can always reuse this paint. So I put out uh, more than I think I need, and then uh, I'd rather have too much than not enough. Another thing I've done is I've toned my canvas. So just a real thin uh, coat of ivory black, and then I've washed, wiped that back out with, uh, with a paper towel. And I'm using um, a walnut alkit oil uh, medium. Uh, made by M. Graham for my for my mixture. So we'll jump right in here. I'm going to be dipping into that medium as I go to thin my paints just a little bit. And one thing I want to point out in this painting is there's it's subtle, but there's actually a zigzag through this painting that leads your eye up and around the composition. So this is really important um, because it gives us a structure to build this composition on. And sometimes before I even start drawing in anything, I'll just get in this big zigzag shape, or sometimes it's a circle or a triangle. Edgar Payne, the great California painter, talked a lot about these design stems in his book. He said uh, he has a whole chapter on how we can you know, build our compositions around the design stems. And the S shape is a great one because it gives the eye room to go in and explore the painting. So we'll start off with that. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and just real quickly sketch in the main outlines here of my shapes. And it's important that you don't get too caught up in detail at this stage. I mean, if we're, if we're focusing on getting the, the facts down as quickly as possible, we really don't want to get too caught up with trying to draw a lot of detail in this early stage. So we're really just mapping out our, our biggest shapes. <laughs> I'm just using a mixture of cadmium red light and ultramarine blue to do this. It's a nice kind of a dark purple uh, that shows up. Um, and I'm not going to worry about these foreground trees. We've got some little trees in here. I'm going to put them in last, but I'm not going to draw them in right now because it would kind of be uh, counterproductive because I'm just going to obliterate them with my background masses. So that's about all the drawing that I want to do right now. We've got this foreground area. We've got the middle ground field. We've got our big mountain shape here, which maybe we'll go ahead and get this, suggest this little shadow in here. Um, and then we've got our sky. So we can think of these as big puzzle pieces fitting together, almost like a poster design. The bigger and bolder that you can make these big shapes in the beginning, the better. Our brain wants to trick us into putting in all the detail. It says, go ahead and paint all the little branches on the tree. Um, but we, we want to wait until the end. So now I'm just mixing a little ultramarine blue and a um, little bit of cadmium red light and just a touch of titanium white. Now, the thing about this, everything's going to be about contrast here because in order to get this, it's tricky sometimes to paint sunsets and sunrises. We've got this really nice warm glow in our piece. And what we have to do is we have to pull everything together um, to contrast with that warmness. So the way that we're going to do that is we're going to make all these other areas in the painting nice and cool and even a little darker. Um, I know a lot of people are experiencing snow and ice right now. And, and I always say one nice thing about a snowy, icy morning is it makes your house feel really cozy. 
And the not my house. What's that? I said, not my house. Here in Texas, they, they're not used to these kind of temperatures, so they don't insulate things as well. Oh, so goodness. It's like 65 <laughs> degrees in the house, and the pipes are frozen, and the power <laughs> may go out at any minute. So. so you have to wrap up in a blanket to feel cozy then, I guess. <laughs> yeah, so if the power goes out, you're on your own, Kyle. Just keep going. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But uh, so by way of contrast, you can feel more cozy when it's cold outside. So we're going to use that same principle here in the painting. We're going to make this area feel nice and warm by surrounding it by some very cool tones. So even my darks here are leaning more towards ultramarine blue and just a touch of ivory black um, to deepen and darken them just a little bit. Now, there's a little fence line in here, but I, again, I don't want to get too detailed. And uh, I'm using rosemary bristle brushes, which are great for, for laying in big areas. And then at the end, I'm going to use some uh, Escoda, they're synthetic mongoose hair uh, brushes. So they're great for detail. Um, and really, we don't have a lot of hard darks in this painting. I mean, we've got that tree line back there. And just a suggestion, but that's really the big dark. So I'm not going to be massing in a bunch of darks here. Just a suggestion, maybe of some little pine trees out here. Um, but the next big area I want to tackle is this foreground. So we've got kind of the middle, middle ground in the foreground. We've got a couple different values. So I, I imagine some of your viewers know what I mean. I'm talking about if we took a black and white picture of this, how dark or how light would my different areas be? Um, Kyle, uh, it's it's funny you should mention that. I'll just come on camera real quickly. Uh, sure. Today's prize is a pair of value specs. These glasses help you see your values. I got an email from a woman this morning. She said she's struggling with values. Now I'm looking out at the snow, and I can really see. I, I would have normally just painted all that snow the same color, but now that I look at it, it's all, you know, I can see the variation in color or in values. Yeah. So uh, the way to win these today, guys, is to uh, leave a message in the uh, comments section. And uh, we are gonna grab somebody at random from anywhere in the world and give away a pair of value specs. And so uh, just leave your uh, comment, try to tell us where you're from. And also uh, the winner of the Make More Money Selling Your Art, my book is Cynthia Watson in Indiana. Thank you, Cynthia. Okay, back to Kyle. Here we go, Kyle. Awesome, <laughs> Eric. That sounds like a very valuable tool to have in your toolbox. It is a very valuable tool. I still use them. I've been, I've been, you know, working on values for 20 years, but they still help me. I still, I put them on before I paint, then I put them on after I paint, and then I make touch up. It makes a big difference. Yeah, and that's so important. Everybody gets caught up with colors, and do I have the right color? And I always say, you know, focus on getting the right values in your piece, and the colors will fall into place a lot more easily. You can get away with using a lot of different colors, but if your values are correct and your, your color temperature is kind of in the right direction, uh, that's gonna be your main uh, thing that makes, makes it work. So uh, I just wanna talk, so this middle ground here has a lot of brush and some trees and everything, but I'm not getting, there's some little tiny Christmas trees actually out there uh, at the scene, but I don't wanna get in there and paint all those Christmas trees because that's not what this painting is about. So again, I talked about decisiveness, Part of the trick of doing this quickly is understanding what story are you telling. You can't tell two stories in one painting. And our story here is about this sunlit mountain. So rather than get in there and try to suggest all these little Christmas trees right now, I'm just using this sort of medium dark value that I've made with um, a little cadmium red light, ultramarine blue, and just a touch of yellow ochre to warm it up in places. Um, and that's going to contrast nicely with some of these cooler, lighter tones in the, in the foreground here. Now, we've got a snow bank here in the foreground, and it's going to be a little darker where the angle is angled slightly away from the sky. So you think of a light coming from above. If it hits the top of your hand, it's nice and bright. But if your hand is tilted up a little bit, sometimes that gets a little darker. So we want to think of our light coming straight down. So the planes that are catching the light are going to be the lightest. Uh, of the snow here and down here, but we've got this little bank in here. And that's nice because that creates this angle that we want for this big zigzag shape. So we're gonna, I'm gonna add a little bit of titanium white to the color that I was already using. Um, and we're just gonna kind of brush in this value here for the bank. Yeah, just real quickly, if you guys just tuned in, our guest today is Kyle Buckland. Kyle 
is in Virginia, and he typically paints these. What size are, are, is this painting that I'm showing on screen, Kyle? That's a 48 by 60. 48 by 60 on location. And what is that easel? Is that a take it easel? That's a take it easel. And uh, it's a wonderful easel for painting large outside, very sturdy, uh, made, in, made in Vermont and just awesome, awesome easel all around. I, I highly recommend it. And then also the palette box, and I'm using it here too. It's a very versatile palette box. I worked with Shamrock Boxes to design this palette box specifically for the take it easel because I wanted something nice and big. So you'll notice that palette is 16 by 20. And when opened, you've got a 16 by 40 workspace. Um, and so and when, when you're painting those big ones outdoors, do you use bigger brushes? I do. Yeah. Generally, you know, that's what I love about the Rosemary and Company brushes is they have the big bristle brushes up to like size 16. So yeah. nice big brushes. And I tell people, I, students always ask me about painting large. And I say, if you have to, just imagine it's an eight by 10 and pretend like you shrunk. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, everything's the same, you know, it's, it's a mindset. So uh, I got bigger piles of paint, bigger brushes, but I'm not trying to approach it in a different way. I'm, I'm really using the same process that I would on a smaller painting. Sometimes we get a little choked up with big paintings. We think we have to put in all this detail because the painting is huge. But, you know, impressionism is about suggesting things. So when we step back is when it really comes together. So I always say, make sure you're stepping back from your work, too, when you're painting large. You have a question that says, Does the, do, do you use the preliminary zigzag shape in all paintings? Not necessarily. Um, so there's different design stems. And um, sometimes I use more than one in, in one painting. But there's also like a circular design stem or a triangular design stem. I tend to favor the S curve or the zigzag design stem. I like to paint a lot of creeks and winding roads and it really lends itself to them. Um, but the trick is you want to get these in there and then hide them. So they're not real recognizable because it's like trying to learn the rules and then forget them a little bit and kind of go on your intuition. So it's great when you're first starting to kind of stick to these design stems uh, because they, they make design kind of come together very easily. Um, but you know, there's a lot to choose from. There's all different ones. And again, Edgar Payne's book, uh, Composition on Outdoor Painting, has a, a whole chapter devoted to design stems. And I talk a lot about them on my YouTube channel, too. So I've got a YouTube channel, The Artful Souls. Uh, if you go on YouTube and search that, you, there's, some, uh, there's some videos on there about that. And then I also have a Patreon page. So you can link from my YouTube videos to my Patreon page, which is patreon.com slash Kyle Buckland. And it's set up kind of as a pay, pay what you can. It's a dollar a month gets you a subscription to that. Um, but then you can adjust your pledge however you feel is fitting to your budget. And I talk a lot about design stems there too, uh, because they're so important. They, they're really like the armature of our paintings. Um, so if you think about a sculpture, you have to have something to build your sculpture on. This zigzag is what we're building this composition on. Outstanding. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, my heat just went out in my studio, so we'll see oh, how no. long I can bear it. <laughs> oh no! Well, if you have to, if you have to go wrap up in a in a blanket, we'll understand. So <laughs> yeah, I've got my jacket. I'll put it on if I have to. Okay. Um, so now I want to go ahead. So here's our here's our our snow bank. Uh, so slightly lighter than this middle ground, but not as light as we're going to have for this area here, where the snow is actually catching the blue sky. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and get that, that other value in now for where the snow is a little bit lighter. And to do this, I'm adding a little bit of cadmium yellow light to the mixture that I was already using. So you'll see me do this, a uh, little titanium white too. A lot of times I'll mix right back into the color that I'm already using on my palette. Um, and this is a way to create a nice color harmony in your work because it gets a little bit of all the colors that you're using into your mixtures. So rather than mix a whole new color, I'm just, I'm just mixing right back into this pile of paint that's already on my, my palette. And we can think about this design stem here. Now I'm using these brush strokes to pull your eye in this way, but watch when we get over here, I can use them to push your eye back over there. So we're not just using lines, but we're using our brush strokes as well to pull your eye and push the viewer's eye in a different direction. Good 
Good tip. Another good uh, idea when you're first starting is to, I always suggest to hold your brush almost like you're sword fighting. Uh, there's a tendency for beginners, especially to hold their brush like a pencil and to get up here. And that really limits your movement to just your wrist. Um, but when you hold your, your, your brush like you're, you're sword fighting, it gets your whole arm and your whole body into the painting, which creates a lot of nice energy and, and movement in your piece and allows you to cover more ground. So when you're painting quickly, you know, I can take my brush and come all the way across here. But if I'm just holding it like this, I'm very limited to what I can do. And we're just going to kind of break up this middle ground just a little bit with some of these lighter tones while we've got them on the brush. And this is a la prima painting. So we're using that paint that's down there to slightly adjust the values of the paint that's going on. So I, the term a la prima is, you know, all at once, the Italian term. Um, and this can be frustrating to get the hang of when you're first starting painting because you go, oh man, all my paint layers are mixing together. But after you practice it a while, you'll notice that you can actually use it to your advantage and you'll start to be able to adjust your values and colors just by grabbing some of that paint that's already on the canvas. I want to soften this edge a little bit. All right, now before we finish any one area, let's keep moving around. Um, saving that orange uh, till we get kind of a little bit more of these values laid in. I want to go in, I'm going to switch my brush now because I am going to go into a warmer tone for the sky. Um, and you're switching your brush because you don't want to pollute, get the, have the cools in it. Is that right? Correct. Yeah, I'm going to switch my brush because I've got all those cool tones in that other brush. Um, but now we're switching. This is like a number eight and these are flat bristle brushes. Now, I don't want to get this too hot. This is going to be that nice little warm cloud right in here. But I want to keep just a little touch of coolness to it because I want the, the warmest area of the painting to be this sunlight up here. So we could be tempted to, to make this way too warm and way too, or, yeah, way too, warm and way too light. Um, but if we think about what we're doing, then we know that we don't want to get it too warm. We want to keep just a little bit of coolness to it. And some of that ivory black tone is going to help us too on the, the canvas. It's picking that up and uh, cooling this off just a little bit and also darkening the value just a tad. Now notice what I'm doing here with my brush strokes. Again, I'm going this way uh, now with my brush strokes. So I'm, because when we get up here, we want to throw the, the viewer's eye back into the painting. Um, back into that composition and keep that zigzag um, movement. I'm going to take this, this tone, this warm tone kind of hangs around the mountain a little bit and it's underneath of the blue in the sky. It's always easier to cool a warm color than to warm a cool color. That's right. So, so we want to put our warms down in areas like this first and then we can come back over top of them and decide how much of them we want to leave in there. Gonna add a little bit more cadmium red to this mixture. You'll notice I'm working with a fairly limited palette too. I don't uh, have a lot of colors on my palette at one time. Generally, the most I'll ever have on my palette is about 10. Sometimes I'll, I'll throw in a phthalo blue or a um, permanent matter deep. But I've found, I've been painting for 22 years now, and I've found that sometimes less is more with colors on the palette. It can get overwhelming sometimes if you have too many well, you get more color harmony. I, I highly recommend that people start out with a with a three color palette and then yeah. and then grow from there, three color plus white. Because if if you learn that, uh, you've got it down and that'll help you with color in the future. But Absolutely. when you start out with 12 or 15 colors on your palette, I probably have 20 on mine, uh, it can get real confusing real fast. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, the, the greats like Kevin McPherson, you know, he only puts three colors on his palette. Yeah. And, you know, if you find the right primaries, and I know some people love that um, split primary, which is a warm and a cool version of each primary. And right. there's so much that you can do with just the primaries. And like you said, once you learn to work within those limitations, then if you do want to get a, a, like a, you know, like a, a phthalo blue or some other color or a permanent green light. It's like you have magic powers after you've already mastered the limited palette. Um, then you get that extra color on there. 
Now I'm going back in with sort of a greenish blue. Again, this is just made with a cadmium yellow light and a touch of ultramarine blue. Um, and I, I'm watching my values here. I want to keep this the same value as my clouds, uh, maybe just a little darker. And keeping those same brush strokes heading back in this direction. And I'm going to throw a little bit of ultramarine blue in this. Now watch how we blend this. I'm going to put this right here. See, I don't come right into the green at first. I want to come right in here with it. Just a touch of medium in there to, to facilitate the, the paint flowing off the brush. When I put that across there, then I'll come back and blend it into that green a little bit. And this creates a nice uh, gradation in the sky and values. Somebody asked why you're not tempted to use a larger brush in those big areas. Um, because for this area, I want to create, um, you know, I could lay it across very quickly, but I don't want to get too much paint on there because I am working um, on creating this subtle grade. And if I have a big brush, I, you know, I could just lay in one big uh, brush stroke of this dark blue, but then I wouldn't be able to get in here and get these little subtle um, differences in here. So I'm kind of creating a little bit of broken brushwork. And I think this medium sized brush is perfect for that. I want to tell everybody, in case you just tuned in, our guest is Kyle Buckland. Uh, he is a painter from Virginia, and he does some pretty amazing paintings, but he loves to paint large. I'm showing you this. Uh, that's a, what did you say, 40 by 40. I uh, painted large uh, really for the first time this summer. I have a um, uh, and plein air pro easel that, um, that I've been trying, and I was able to get a pretty large piece on that but not as large as I could with the, with the one that you talked about, uh, the take it easel. And mm -hmm. I'll tell you, it's very freeing to paint large. The other thing is uh, if you force yourself to paint large in the same amount of time as you would a normal small painting, now you have a large painting to sell. It's, it's, you've got much more value. That's great. Yeah. And there's, you know, all, all of my heroes painted large. So I, I, I really, idolize the, uh, the the greats of art history, Monet, Claude Monet, and some of the Pennsylvania Impressionists like Edward Redfield. Yeah. Uh, you know, they, they would go out and paint these big giant paintings. And that's, that's in my mind, you know, I, I, I never equated plein air painting with small. Not to say that there's not something to be said for a small painting. I like, you know, little paintings too, but I, I really love getting out and pushing, pushing the paint around on a big canvas. It's really freeing. It's a lot of fun. And uh, it, I have found that people tend to paint larger back east than they do in the west, and I think it seems to be probably because of the you know the 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 great Pennsylvania impressionists who did it. Um, I had a painter tell me one time. He said, "You know, you can't make any money if you paint small. <laughs> you got to keep painting the paint box and keep the lights on in the studio." So. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm getting in here now with this orange. This is just cadmium red and light and cadmium yellow light. And you can see because we've kept everything nice and dark and cool that when we put this orange on there, it really sings. Um, one important thing to note is that I didn't say that I used any white here. So a lot of people think to get something to be brighter, they need to put white in their, their paint. But um, if you can get it without using white, that's probably going to be better because White has a tendency to make things look a little chalky, and it also has a tendency to cool off your colors a little bit. So to keep this nice and warm, we're really kind of sticking with this, uh, just a mixture of these pure colors, cadmium yellow light, cadmium red light. We might use a touch of yellow ochre in there to dull it down in a couple places, but very little, if any, white in this. And I'm also grading this a little bit more towards yellow this way, because this is really our center of interest, right where this cloud is and all this. We want to keep your eye in this direction. So I've darkened the value and I've leaned it a little towards the red side over here. Love those days when you look up and you see a glowing mountain like that. Yeah. Yeah. I think what's that Alpen glow, I guess is the word for that. That's a new word I learned recently. Um, but yeah, this, you know, it's something magical about it, and, and um, it's so fleeting, and I think things that are fleeting just have that quality to them that uh, are sort of poetic quality to something like this because it's, you know, you look and you see it, and then you look again, and it's gone. So. 
Well, this shadow has a lot of nice color to it. And this is going to contrast. This is the complementary color of orange, this nice blue. So not only are we using value to create contrast, but we're also using color. Because when we have complementary colors like blue and orange that are placed side by side, they help accentuate each other. Now, the opposite of that is when you mix complementary colors, they neutralize each other. So that's an important thing to know when you're working with a limited palette, because if I want an orange to be dulled down, I can add blue. I don't have to add black to it. Yeah. There's a touch of like a luminous quality to the shadow right in the middle of it. So I'm going to go just a little bit lighter and not too light. So you put stuff up there, you can see, oh, that's too light. You know, we've got to darken it a little bit. You don't have to get it right on the first try, but you want to adjust it right in here. There's a nice luminous quality to that shadow. And then there's just a touch of shadow up here too. Let me get that in. So now we're already creating a sense of light and atmosphere and, and movement in our piece. Um, and I don't want it, like I said, I don't want to try to finish any one part. So I want to keep moving around. It's, I, I like bringing up a painting all at once. Uh, creates a nice organic flow to it. Hello, so New Zealand. Look. Hello, Ireland. Hello, England. Hello, awesome. South Africa. Make sure you tell us where you're watching from. We love hearing from you. Yes. Hello, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. It's so great that we can do this and that everybody can get together virtually. Uh, I know we're all longing for social interaction, so it's so awesome that uh, everybody's tuning in and that, uh, that this is taking place. We're beyond longing. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're ready. We're ready to get out. Norway, welcome, Norway. <laughs> there's a nice purple cloud up here, and it's because there's a cloud that's in a shadow of another cloud. So I'm going to use this purple cloud to, to finish our, the rest of our zigzag here. Can you move your camera up just a touch? We can't see that top area. Sure. Thank you. If I can move it back just a little bit too, so you can get the, the right. How's that look? Uh, bring it down a little bit more because there's some stuff at the top of the screen blocking it. Bring it down. There we go. There we go. That's right there. Yep, that'll work. Okay. Almost. Yeah. So we've got this kind of purple cloud in there too which is just cadmium red light and a little ultramarine blue. It's just slightly darker than the rest of the sky. Um, and I'm going to shift it back towards the blue a little bit. All right. I'm trying to keep an eye on the clock. Now, this is important. I'm working with a sense of urgency here. And when you're, especially when you're outside and you're working on a scene like this, the light changes so quickly that, it, you know, you, all, you almost have to work a little faster than you can think and let your intuition take over. And so, you know, this is easier to do the more you paint and the more you have experience painting. Uh, so that's why I always say just get out there and push paint around. If you're first starting, you know, don't even worry too much about the results because they'll, the results will come. The more you paint, um, the more you're going to get better. I mean, it's inevitable that you will get better at it. And you have How to panel are you using? Somebody's asking. Uh, this is a stretched uh, Clausen's uh, medium smooth uh, oil primed linen. Um, and it's on a board? It's stretched or on a board? It's stretched. Okay. Yeah, it's a stretched canvas. I like stretched canvases. They have a nice spring to them. When I work small, I work on panels, like the Centurion Deluxe linen panels. Um, and, what and, about work, Poland, and what about when you are out uh, painting those big giant ones on location? A lot of the big ones are uh, like pre-stretched canvas, uh, just cotton canvas. Really? Um, because you would think they would act like a sailboat. <laughs> Yeah, I got to be careful about going out on windy days. Um, and I also use Velcro ankle weights to help weight down my easel. You can strap those things. You can strap 10 of those onto your easel. Those little ankle weights, and they're great for weighting down your easel. Um, and then this, the shamrock box weighs in a little bit, so that helps sturdy everything and, and uh, keep that. And that take it easel has such a wide footprint. Um, but you still have to be careful. On windy days, it will definitely just pick up and blow away with you if you're if you're not careful. Yeah. All right. So um, we're, we just about got this block mask in, and then we're going to start kind of embellishing details. There's a little bit of snow. Now, this mountain is actually called White Top Mountain, and it gets its name because it gets snow up here on the top part of it, and the snow seems to stay there all winter long. 
Um, so we want to get that little bit of snow. So this little value is probably our lightest value in the whole piece. Um, and I'm just going to pop that in just so we have that complete range of value. Now we can start decorating things here. Now I'm um, curious so because you've got that yellow light. Is, is, that, is that mountain slammed with yellow light or is it fall leaves? Uh, this is, this is, yeah, this is yellow light and the, the white actually probably looks a, maybe a little cooler on camera. There's a spot of it on there and it's not as prominent in my study, but I remember, and I thought to myself, when I paint this bigger, I'm going to do this. There's a hot, like a lemon yellow bit in here. Yeah. That's what I was wondering about is if it were light, afternoon light, it would be picking up a little warmth in that snow. Yeah. And it's probably looking a little cooler next to all that orange, but there was one little spot right in there that was catching that nice warm. Um, and it's, you know, it's, uh, it's way back there too. So it might be that that snow is just getting a little bit of that coolness from that atmospheric perspective. Um, so how do you deal with a, a canvas like that, carrying it into the field, carrying it out wet? You must keep your car pretty close. <laughs> I do. And in fact, I bought a, I bought a short school bus, one of those old uh, school buses and tore all the seats out of it so that I could carry those big canvases around. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah. yeah I guess yeah, you, you can't can... get one of those into a regular car. Yeah. It's, people always ask me that. They say, how in the world do you transport that canvas back? Um, but yeah, it's, it, that, that bus, it's about a 20 foot, 21 foot long school bus. It really does the trick. So. It's gonna, we'll have to have Raymar make a giant box for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so now let's now let's go back and start decorating areas. So I was reading uh, Sir Alfred East's book on landscape painting, and he said you could think of painting as stacking coins up. And we first have like the silver dollar and then a 50 cents piece and then a, a quarter. And then on top of that, we have our, our nickels and our dimes. So basically what he's saying is we start with these big shapes, then we start decorating them into uh, smaller shapes. So we're going to start going back into our um, foreground here, and I'm going to mix up a dark purple. And uh, we want to do this pretty quickly. Again, I want, I want to be able to get this most of the way done here so I can show you this process. Um, now I'm holding the brush a little bit different. I want these little descriptive touches. Um, and this is just little bits of pieces of grass sticking through and just little twigs popping up through here. And it's almost like we've mapped out our values. So now we can go back in and start to suggest this detail and be amazed at how little it takes to start really bringing the piece to life um, once you've mapped out these values correctly. So I would say, you know, if, if, if you take your time at any, you know, you want to work fast, but make sure you're working uh, with correct values. So work as fast as you can work uh, correctly. I guess is a good way to put that. Hey, if you're a first timer and you're watching for the first time, just put a comment in, you know, just put first timer and say where you're watching from. Just curious. Thank you. Uh, this is day number 327 started since coronavirus. We're here every day at 12 noon lunchtime in the East. I'm not in the East. I'm in Austin, Texas, but we do it based on lunchtime in New York. We also have every day at 3 PM, we have a video segment that we're offering uh, today is uh, no exception. We have Dina Peterson, who's going to uh, do How to Paint Like Van Gogh. She did the movie uh, Loving uh, Vincent, and she had to learn how Van Gogh paints. And she, of course, has a video out on that. And so you can learn from that video today at 3 p.m. Just uh, tune in the same place, Facebook or YouTube. Uh, just search Streamline Art Video. Okay, Kyle, thank you for your patience. Yeah, no problem. Very cool movie, by the way. That's an awesome film. If, if you haven't seen it, Loving Vincent just uh, just moved me to almost you know to tears watching that in the in the movie theater. Well, it's it the first movie. animated film that was done with all oil paint. Yeah, and I mean, how cool is that? If you yeah. have any interest in art whatsoever, it's definitely worth yeah worth watching. Dina did a, a terrific job. She was one of. I don't know, 20 animators or something. And she had to paint uh, something like 3,000 paintings in that one year period of time. Yeah, several, I, mean, several I, watching, every day. My, I, I don't know how many times my jaw just dropped watching that movie, just thinking about the amount of work that went into creating something uh, of that nature. Very creative. 
So now I've switched to these uh, Escoda, they're synthetic mongoose hair brushes. Can't remember the name, the actual, you know, the style of brush they are, but they're great. They're synthetic mongoose. They're a little stiffer than a bristle, uh, or a little stiffer than a sable, but a little softer than a bristle brush. So they hold a good amount of paint. And I'm putting in these trees. So I'm starting with a little bit of pressure down here. And then as I pull up, I'm letting off the, the pressure and it creates a, a tapering type of brush stroke here. And this is more you know, a value than it is a color. It's purple, but what I want is this nice deep dark color here. And I brushed in just a little bit of a, a sort of a darker purple up in here, uh, a little darker than the sky, but, but a little lighter than our other purples just to create like a tree screen of branches. So I'll do it over here too, you can kind of see. And what this does is when we draw those branches up into the, that tone, it creates the illusion that there's a million little branches up in there. It's all this about is where, illusions. go ahead. I said, it's all about illusions. It is, that's right, we're magicians and that's, you know, it's uh, it, the more you paint, the more you figure out these little uh, shortcuts to, to creating the effect. And those are so important when you're painting outside because everything is happening so quickly. And, uh, you know, even when you're in the studio, like I said, it, this is kind of a lesson on how to, to capture that vitality of a plein air study um, back in the studio. And, and um, if you feel like you're having trouble, I say even get a kitchen timer and set the timer for an hour and promise yourself that when that timer dings, you're done. And that'll help create that sense of urgency. So we're, we're creating um, these trees here. I wanna pull some more out into here because what I don't want is like a group here, an equal space, and then a group here. I right. really want like this opening to kind of be over here just a little bit and not directly centered. We're trying to stay away from, from keeping things completely centered in our painting, uh, just to create the comp uh, more interesting design and composition. So I'm adding a little bit more trees in this than there actually um, were at the uh, at the actual scene. That reminds me of one of my favorite quotes. Charles Mavali is a great painter of the Cape Ann School, and he helped edit the uh, work on the um, the Emil Groupie books. But he said in an interview. He said, we're not going to put the shapes where they are, of course. We're going to put them where they look good in our picture. I thought that was awesome because that's what painting is all about. Sounds like you're a pretty well-read guy. You do a lot of reading. <laughs> yeah, I started a, a, a lifelong obsession when I was about 15 years old with art books. And um, I'm going to have to build a, a wing onto my house to start housing them if I, if I keep going at the rate I'm going. <laughs> I went to Russia first time I went to Russia, which was 2004, um, I came home with a suitcase full of art books I couldn't get here. And it cost me more for the extra baggage on the suitcase than it did for the airplane tickets. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, it's, it's addictive. It's a, I guess uh, there are worse things to be addicted to, but uh, it's definitely an addiction. I, I love, you know, there's something nice about the 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 analog quality of just sitting down and reading a good old fashioned art book. Yep. So we're at about the 12 minute mark, Kyle, you got about 12 minutes left. All right. So we're coming down to the wire. So you can see, we're already starting to create a nice sense of, of detail here without doing a whole lot. Um, you know, moving this brush around, it's dancing all around. It's creating contrast. I wanted to get some of these little fence posts in. Uh, there's a little fence line where these trees are. Um, so we're kind of getting that in there. We can draw some nice little, real fine little marks down in here. There's something I love about a painting that's painted in big, broad masses, um, and then is kind of embellished with these little tiny strokes and little bits of detail because it creates this nice dynamic quality in the energy of the piece. You have these big, broad strokes in the beginning, and then these little tiny touches that just really start to to animate the surface. And um, one thing I want to do is get, there's a little bit of sunlight that hits the tops of these branches. So a real small round brush, like a number one, and almost some pure orange here. So just cadmium red light, cadmium yellow light, 
And we're going to hit a couple of these branches right here with some of this nice hot orange color because this sun is just coming down and there's a ridge behind me and it's just setting over the ridge, but it's catching the tops of these, of these branches. And they're really starting to glow in places here. It's because we kept the value of our sky down, we get that nice orange to really stand out. Now, if we hadn't been aware of how, you know, we wanted to darken that sky in the beginning, this wouldn't work because you wouldn't see these nice little touches of, uh, of orange in there. Some of these are a little bit too dark. We want to get some of those little spots to go away. Three favorite books on painting. Go. Uh, Carlson's Guide to Landscape Painting. Got it right here. Um, yeah, and... Um, Land, landscape painting for the oil color by Sir Alfred East. Got it here. Um, and uh, composition on outdoor painting by Edgar Payne. I mean, it's it's hard to cut. It's hard to narrow it down to three. I've got about a hundred more I can name off. I get, I get it. Yeah, I think <laughs> the Edgar Payne is it's always at my bedside because I'm always rereading it. Yeah, I can't and read so that much enough. And the reread, you know, when you read something, like the first time I read Carlson's Guide to Landscape Painting, I was like in 10th grade. And there's a great story about that book on uh, Carl Olson's The Artful Painter podcast when I was on there. Uh, I didn't understand any of that thing when I first read it. And then I reread it and I got about 20% of it. And then I was like, you know, and I still now, 20 some years later, I still pick it up. And it's just like, oh, wow, you know, I, I can really start to grasp some of these concepts more and more. And I think that's because we change as painters. The more experience we have painting, it's like when you see a great painting, you know, when you first start painting, you're kind of mystified by what makes a great painting. Then the more you paint, uh, you start to understand just a little bit more about what's going on and, and what the painters were thinking uh, when they did certain things or made certain brush strokes. It's always a new experience. Another book somebody mentioned is Ala Prima, Richard Schmid. Uh, yeah. the, new, the new one, the new updated one. Yep, and his he has a nice book on landscape painting, too. Yeah, his um, old, old books are hard to find. Yeah, I have to mention The Art Spirit, too, by Robert Henry. Yep. Great, a great book that's always on my, my list of recommendations for yep. folks that are getting into painting. I love to go. I, I go to uh, whatever, whenever I travel, which hasn't been much lately. I, I try to go to stores that have antique books because oftentimes you'll find antique books that, uh, you know, could be a hundred years old on painting. I've got an old one on French. Uh, it was a, on French painting. Uh, it's in English surprisingly, but it's an old one and probably a hundred years old. Yeah. I love those. I have, um, Emil Zola's the masterpiece, which was that book that Zola wrote that Cezanne kind of got mad about because he thought he was poking fun at him in the, in the book. Um, but it really talks a lot about French Impressionism in the early days of Impressionism. It's a really neat, neat book. Yeah, it's great. I, that's a, it's a, I don't have that one. That's a uh, good have one. Have you ever been to Baldwin's Book Barn in, in Pennsylvania? No, I haven't. Oh, you have to get up there. It's an old, uh, I think, an 18th century barn that they've renovated and turned into an antique bookstore. Uh, it's not too far from Chad's Ford area where the Wyatts are from. And lots of rare old art books. It's like a going on a treasure hunt every time I go in there. <laughs> so okay, we're coming down. Well, I've got it added to my list. Yeah, yeah. Baldwin's Book Barn. In, in, uh, I can't remember exactly. Maybe maybe somebody watching can chime in. And I've never been to Chad's that. Ford. I, I, I'd like to go. I have some friends from that area, some who knew Wyeth. And... Uh, so I'd love to go there and, and uh, pay homage, I suppose. Yeah, it's a great, and you can go tour N.C. Wyeth's studio. And uh, I, I was born in uh, Wilmington, Delaware, which is not far from Chad's Ford. So I used to go when I'd go visit family, and when I was young, we'd go up in there and hang out in the. It was the countryside back, you know. Nice. Out of the, as far as a big contrast from growing up in the city, I grew up right outside of Philadelphia in Wilmington, Delaware. So. Well, somebody's already posted the address on the comments. Eight eight thirty five awesome. Lenape Road, Westchester. Should be yeah, Lenape yeah, Road. I'm telling yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. So we're getting down. You got fire. about you got about three three minutes left, and we're going to have you come back on camera. Okay. 
Yeah, so we're just kind of wrapping things up, pulling things together. I'm pushing a little thing. I've pushed that a little hotter right up in there where that orange is. A little bit of thicker paint to kind of make that area really stand out. Let's see you do it. You got a little time. And, uh, you know, when I say thick paint, I like thick paint, too. I like a big blob of paint on the brush. And we start to paint with, with, with you know, so the brush isn't even touching the canvas. There's a thick, fat layer of paint between the brush and the canvas. Yeah, just make sure you do that later in the later in the painting. If you paint thin over thick, you're going to have cracks. Exactly. Yeah, you want to start thin and, and dark and work towards your thick and light areas. And just a little bit of blue, just pushing the cool. So now we're just kind of flexing these different cools and warms. And uh, I think that's about it. You know, I don't want to overwork it. Um, and if, I want to create a sense of vitality and, and the feeling of as if we were out there painting and we're rushing to get that that last little bit of light. So we really don't want you can you can overwork something. I'd rather underwork a painting than overwork a painting. And we want to aim for that complete uh, feeling and that perfect medium. But there's something to be said for a nice quick study. Uh, you can you can work that that uh, vitality right out of a piece if you're not careful. So this is about 95% done. And what I usually like to do is kind of take a break, maybe go get a cup of coffee and set it up in the studio. And then it's usually just a few little things here and there. So if you tune back in uh, probably later today to my website, kylebuckland.com, you'll get to see the finished piece. It'll be on there um, available. I'm going to ask you, Kyle, to go ahead and post it on, on the Facebook as well. Uh, sure. Kyle, why don't you come back on camera, everybody. Right. Thumbs up and applause for Kyle Buckland. A uh, fabulous demo. Very nice. Thank you. All right. Terrific. Well, Kyle, it's been a pleasure having you on the show today. Uh, it's a pleasure to get to know you. I don't think we've met in person yet, so we'll have no, to do I, that. I feel like I know you. I've been I've been keeping up with you for a long time and uh, subscribing to the magazines and watching you. So it's a like an honor and a privilege, you know, to be here. And and like I said, I just you're you're a great inspiration to so many people and myself included. Well, the honor is all mine. It's an honor to meet you and get to know you as well. Everybody, thumbs up for Kyle. Kyle, one more time, you have YouTube videos and you have a Patreon page. Uh, tell everybody about that. I do. Um, the Artful Souls is my YouTube channel and my Patreon page. If you go to patreon.com slash Kyle Buckland, um, you can Google me and um, you know, you'll find my website, kylebuckland.com. You can link to all my uh, social media from there and and, uh, okay. Well, I think it's important, you guys, who are, we're all trying to support each other during these times. And so if you, you want to go to his Patreon page and, and add a little, little uh, change into that, that would be helpful, I'm sure. Kyle, thank you. I hope everybody will hang around for just a second. Kyle, it's a pleasure. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll meet again, I'm sure. Nice awesome. job. Thank you. Thank you. Our guest today was Kyle Buckland. I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher of Fine Art Connoisseur and Plein Air Magazine. If you're new today, Welcome. We're here every day at 12 noon. Uh, I noticed a couple new people in the comments that I've not seen before. Thank you for that. Reminder that in the comments, whether you're watching live or in replay, we're giving away today. The uh, prize will be value specs. You'll get a chance to, to, uh, to buy them. I mean, to buy them, to win them, and they help you see the values. I'm looking out at the snow. Do you want to see the snow? Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have snow, but uh, let's see if I can, I can show it there. Uh, you can see the trampoline, that's the kid's trampoline, and lots of snow. And uh, we've been uh, trying to feed the birds and, and give them a little, uh, little help there because there's a lot of spring birds that came. Anyway, uh, love you guys being here. Thank you for doing it. A couple of reminders for today. First off, our guest tomorrow is Eric Johnson. Eric Johnson, uh, look at that. That's his son. And uh, he does, uh, he, he's the one who did a video on Rembrandt and does a very detailed in-depth painting. And you're going to want to see that. Also, our guest today at 3 p.m. is Dina Peterson, How to Paint Like Van Gogh. And you're going to get a chance to see how she does this and the technique she learned from doing the movie uh, Loving Vincent. And so that's pretty cool. Also, I want to tell you guys, in case you missed it, we normally do the plein air convention. It was going to be in May, and we just had to pull the plug on it. We just didn't feel it was going to be safe by May. We just, I, I, everybody's got questions about 
should they go? Should they not go? Is it going to be distanced? And it just was, it was very clear. It was just too soon. So we had to cancel it last year. We're having to cancel it this year. So we would love it if you would join us for our new Plen Air Live. And Plen Air Live is a virtual conference online. Uh, we've got a lot of people signed up already. We've got five, 600 people already joining us from 40 countries around the globe. Uh, you got Bill Davidson, Camille Preswadic, Christine Lashley, Dave Santianes, Don Whitelaw, Don Demers, uh, John McCartan, Joe McGurl, Kathleen Dunphy, Kevin McPherson, Lori Putnam, Michelle Usipelli, Joan Stern, and many more who are about to be put up there. And so it's a really terrific event and you should join it. And if you sign up before February 28th, you're going to save quite a bit of money. So go ahead and get that done. Also would ask that you guys give me a follow. My name is Eric Rhodes, E-R-I-C Rhodes. No E. A. There's an A in there and there's no E. All right. And we have a gift for you if you're new. 97 Amazing Painting Secrets from the World's Best Artists. Just go to 97tips.com. You can get a DVD or a video. It's our gift to you. And last but not least, I want to remind you guys that the Plein Air Salon Art Competition is going to end soon. And when I say end soon, end for the year, meaning get your entries in. You don't have to have fresh paintings. Your entries for uh, winning up to 30000 in cash prizes, the top prize is the cover of Plein Air Magazine and $15,000 cash. That's Dave Santianis who won the last one. We're going to announce the winners in the new salon on Plein Air Live uh, in April. And so you, uh, you've you got to get it in before February 28th, get your, your entry in, and then there's one more chance before March 15th. And then we pull the plug and uh, and do it. So you anyone who wins in any category, uh, any category at all, it could be a nocturne category or a drawing category, any category, if you win in that, you're entered into the national competition. All right. Well, thanks again to Kyle Buckland and thank you for tuning in. I'm in Austin, Texas. I don't know if I'll be here tomorrow or not. They've been doing rolling brownouts. Uh, uh, some people on my team in Austin have no power. Their pipes are frozen. My pipes are frozen. My pipes are frozen. Uh, and uh, that's an old radio joke. Anyway, uh, so have a great day. Thanks for watching. And we'll see you tomorrow if the power is here. And if we have heat, all right, thanks again. Uh, I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher of Fine Art Connoisseur and Plint Air Magazine. Make sure to leave a comment. We'll see you tomorrow. And thanks again to Kyle Buckland.